All right, our Bible study this morning is from Acts chapter 4. I'm going to close out chapter 4, and it actually flows right into chapter 5, so we're also going to look at the first 11 verses of chapter 5. But we're going to start at Acts 4 at verse 32. So if you'll turn there in your Bibles to Acts 4 verse 32. If you're new to Cornerstone, we, we just go straight through the Bible from cover to cover. We've been making our way through the book of Acts presently, and here we are in, in chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading at verse 32. It says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now into chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. And so great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. And then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. And then immediately she, she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young man came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So, verse 11, great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Yeah, I bet it did. <laughs> God starts popping off a couple people in church service, you'll have the fear of God in you too. <laughs> by the way, sometimes people ask me, do you believe in being slain in the Spirit? Yeah, Acts chapter 5. <laughs> they were slain by God's Spirit. They were killed by God. Now, the question becomes, why would God do such a drastic thing? We're going to talk about it today. We're going to answer it. What started out so, like, tender and generous, everybody pooling their resources, sharing it to everybody who has need, ends up with a very tragic scene here with the death of two followers of Jesus, Ananias and Sapphira. So, I've entitled today's teaching, Lessons from the Early Church. I've subtitled it, Don't Lie or You Could Die. <laughs> so let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time in your word. We pray you would speak to our hearts as we study these verses together. There's much to learn here, Lord, so teach us, we pray. And we're thankful. We're thankful for your grace. We're thankful for your love, Lord. And as we gather here in your name, where two or more are gathered, there you are in our midst. So you're here, Lord. And we pray that you would be glorified in all that you see and hear. And that you would speak to our hearts along the way as we open ourselves to the work of your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. So jump back up to chapter 4. Let's kind of unpack this um, a few verses at a time. Back up in verse 32, the opening verse, it speaks about the unity and the oneness that the early church experienced when it says there in verse 32 that they were of one heart and one soul. There was a closeness and a common bond that the early church had. And that closeness and common bond grew out of two common things. They had common beliefs, 
primarily that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Messiah, so that united them. But we also see here that they also shared common burdens. And the common burdens that they shared was that they were now being targeted by an unbelieving world. We're going to see, starting here and ongoing, and increasingly so, through the book of Acts and really through the rest of the New Testament, that there was great persecution that broke out against the early church. You have to remember that for Jews to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the one that the prophets had long predicted for centuries, that was an anomaly to the majority. The majority rejected Jesus. The majority asked for Jesus to be crucified, and their wish was granted by Pontius Pilate. So those who are believers in Jesus are a minority. Now, uh, a few thousand got saved on the day of Pentecost, and we see later that a couple more thousand get saved. So the early church is slowly growing here, and, and it may be as large as five to 10,000 believers at this point, but there's still a great majority of Jews who do not believe that Jesus is the Christ. Then they've got the Roman Empire to deal with that uh, always believed that Caesar was Lord. And so anybody who believed that anybody else was Lord, you were in danger of losing your life. So the early church was under tremendous persecution, persecution from other Jews who didn't believe that Jesus was Messiah, persecution from the Roman Empire who believed that Caesar is Lord. And so for that reason, they united, the early church did. They came together. They were united on a common bond, a common bond of beliefs and a common bond of burdens. And as it relates to these, the burdens of being persecuted by those who didn't share their, their beliefs, um, they, they rallied together. You know, um, if, if, you're, if you're facing some kind of a, an, a, of a threat along with others, you tend to, even if you don't know each other very well, you tend to rally together. You will, you will, you know, to use a term, you will circle the wagons and you will enter survival mode because you're both uh, dealing with the same threat or the same enemy. And th this is the early church. They came together and they united. They had a bond. They had a brotherhood. They had a sisterhood because of their shared beliefs and their shared burdens, that they were under constant threat of persecution and attack. Their lives were in jeopardy. It wasn't just, you know, they might lose their jobs. They might literally lose their heads, and many of them did. And so because of that, you have to imagine, that, that strengthened their resolve. That united them. They were of one heart, and they were of one soul because it was birthed out of this constant, you know, common belief and common burden. The same people who crucified Jesus were now after them. And so they were keenly aware that there was a life, that uh, their lives were in jeopardy and there was a lot that was at stake. And so we see this unity that the early church uh, took on. And one of the ways it's reflected here is the way that they took care of each other materially. So back here in chapter 4, look at verse 34 again. Back, back in chapter 4, verse 34, it says, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Now, there's a point of clarification here, and context is everything, because at first glance, this looks like socialism, doesn't it? You know, some, some classless society where everybody pools their possessions and then some centralized government, in, in this case the apostles who are in charge, equally redistribute the wealth to anyone who has need. And as we know, socialism has gotten a lot of traction of late in the United States. In fact, particularly among the age demographics of college students. In a recent survey, for the very first time in American history, more college students think more favorably of socialism than they do of capitalism. For the first time, college students think more favorably about socialism by a majority than capitalism. And the idea of free stuff and the redistribution of wealth appeals to a lot of people, particularly to people who don't have very much and to those who have a heart for those who don't have very much. But the problem with socialism that they don't often tell you on the front end because the appeal is to free stuff, 
The problem with socialism is that it enslaves you to a system and it robs you of your dignity and of your self-worth and of any kind of personal success because you really earn nothing. You just simply become subjects of the state. You have no incentive to work because everything you make has to be redistributed to others. My dad taught me this proverb as a young kid. Many of you have probably heard this, but I remember hearing this growing up. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. There's a difference there. You can constantly give somebody something, but they never learn how to take care of themselves because the state's gonna take care of them and they never achieve and they never have any dignity about anything that they've accomplished because they're totally subject to the state. And so I wanna make this clear as we move forward, there's gonna be some lessons we learn of the early church. Here's the first one. The early church was not practicing socialism. They were practicing survivalism. Socialism is not taught in the Bible, hard work is. Let me give you a few verses about hard work. I'm just going to rattle these off quicker than you can turn there. But listen, 2 Thessalonians 3.10, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. It's pretty direct. 1 Timothy 5.8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Proverbs 12, 11, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Proverbs 14, 23, all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. 2 Thessalonians 3, 8, Paul said, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, end quote. Many verses in the Bible that talk about a hard work ethic. Don't expect people to just give you stuff for free. You have to work hard. This is what the Bible teaches. Now, I don't want us, therefore, when you look at this story that we're going through, and I, no, I picked it intentionally because I think it's important to address this. Don't take this one example of, in the Bible of this somewhat communal living where everybody pooled their resources together and then they redistributed it to people who had need. Don't think of it as promoting socialism. Here's why. Sometimes when you read your Bibles, you have to be careful not to make a pattern out of a practice. Okay? Here's the practice that was going on in the context of our story. You're a Jew living in the first century who believes that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are now instantly ostracized and marginalized by everybody else who doesn't share your belief system, and that's the majority. And, and, and more than being ostracized and marginalized, I mean, your life is in jeopardy. But what would typically happen, we know this historically, is that as a Jew in the first century, you trust Christ as your savior and the majority of people are against you because they don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, your family held a funeral for you. You know, still today in some strict Orthodox homes and, and other religious uh, beliefs where people don't align with the system, they will have a funeral for you. They disown you. They no longer see you as part of the family. That's what was happening in the first century. On top of that, think about it. You have your own business but now you're one of those Christ followers, nobody's buying at your shop anymore. You're not getting any income and nobody wants to sell to you. They're not gonna sell you their goods because you're one of those Jesus followers. And so at worst in the first century, they would kill you. At best in the first century for being a follower of Jesus, they would cancel you, all right? Cancel culture is nothing new, friends. It's been around for centuries. It just will morph depending on what the latest hot topic is that the world doesn't like that you stand for. So it was happening here. It, it happens now. And look, friends, it's not going to get better. It will only get worse. Last year, I was speaking at a church in California, and afterwards, there was a private meeting that I was invited to with about 30 people in the room. It was made up of myself and maybe one other pastor, but otherwise it was lawyers, doctors, bankers, elected officials. And the purpose of the meeting, they were all believers, and the purpose of the meeting was to discuss 
What's the strategy for us to provide resources to the Christian community because the more the world goes the direction it's going, the more likely that we are to be canceled and denied services and resources that are critical. So the purpose of those 30 or so gathered in the room was to decide how can we as bankers start our own banks for Christians, our own hospitals, because doctors and nurses have been canceled of late. You know, think, think. It's either because they don't like the message, okay, or government control, think pandemic. And so they will try to cancel you or manipulate you or control you in some way, shape, or form. And I'm sitting in this room with with bankers and lawyers and doctors and educators and elected officials, and they're talking about how do we plan for survival in a world that cancels us from the resources that we need because we're losing our jobs and and they are closing down this and they're closing down that. And so maybe we need to start our own hospitals, our own schools, our own banks. This is the kind of discussion that I'm sitting in this room going, have we really gotten to this point? Like, Jesus, rapture us before we have to go this route. You know what I'm saying? Like, Lord Jesus, come soon and just take us out of this mess. But until that day happens, do we need to think about the same kind of survival mode that the early church considered? You know what I find interesting is that sometimes people, when, especially when we're going through the book of Acts, sometimes people will come to me and they will say this. They will say, Pastor Gary, you know, I would just love to see today's church return to the days of the early church. <laughs> now, when they say that, I know what they mean. What they mean is the good stuff. Like, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could see signs and wonders and miracles today like they saw in the days of the early church? And I believe in all those things, okay? But what I want to remind people is, if you're looking to live out church today like the early church was then if you're wanting signs, you better be prepared for the suffering. Because they go hand in hand. Wherever you have the Spirit of God moving, you are going to have the spiritual forces of evil coming against the move of God. So the more the Spirit of God is moving, the more the enemy ratchets up the spiritual forces of evil to try to come against the work of God. Now, the spiritual forces of evil will not prevail because the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. But we better be prepared for the kind of persecution, being ostracized, marginalized, canceled, like the early church was experiencing. You want to go back to first century early church? Okay, fine. We need to be prepared for that. But just be ready, because it's not just about signs and wonders and miracles. It's about suffering, suffering of the worst kind. And when I'm in this meeting in California with these people, and it you know, causes me to, to think about, well, you know, how severe is this? Well, then I, then I meet a man in the meeting, a pastor of a church, a large church in Northern California, whose bank, who held the note on the church loan, did not like some of the things that the pastor was saying from the pulpit. So the bank called the note. Pay up your loan right now or we'll foreclose on you because we don't like what you're saying. There's another guy attending the meeting who has a ministry, travels the country. Many of you would probably know him if I uh, know his name, if I told you. He got frozen out of his bank accounts. He called the bank and said, for some reason, my credit cards are not working. My debit cards are not working. Oh, yeah, yeah, because we don't like what what you're saying. We don't like your message. So we've frozen your accounts. He couldn't even get into his own money. They had temporarily frozen it said, you can find other banks and we'll give you your money back, but you're not having access to your money here at our bank. This is the kind of thing that is happening in the world. It's not far-fetched. We have to be prepared. So, work hard. The Bible gives a strong work ethic. But be prepared to share with others in need if the times demand it. And that's what was happening in the first century. The times demanded it. These people were in survival mode. How are we going to survive? You know what we have to do? Let's pool our resources together. And, and let's distribute it as people have need just so we can survive. This is not a pattern. This was a practice. It was never repeated again in the New Testament. This was, a, this was a practice out of necessity for survival. 
So I want, to, I want to make sure everybody sees that, because if you don't understand context, you're going to look at this and go, seems like socialism is a biblical thing. No, hard work is a biblical thing. But they had to pool their resources out of necessity in order to survive. But then here's where we come to this tragic part about this husband and wife getting killed. Look now, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, where it says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession. We find out later it was land. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it. And he, Ananias, brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So, just to kind of summarize, as people were selling off certain possessions, in this case it was land, and they were bringing the proceeds and they were giving it to the apostles, trusting the apostles to distribute it as, as they saw the early church people needed it. Here comes this one couple, Ananias and his wife Sapphira. We learn in the story they come at different times. Ananias comes first, and he presents proceeds from the sale of land. But he kept back some of them, and he presented some of the proceeds to the apostles. The sin was not that they held back some of the proceeds. The sin was deception, that they gave the impression they were giving this full-on offering to God the total price for the sale of the land. The impression that they gave was deceptive. That's why they lied. And that's why they faced consequence. So again, their sin was not withholding a portion of the proceeds for themselves. I'll talk about it in a little bit. The sin was giving the impression that they were bringing all of it as an offering to the Lord. And that deception was sin. So Peter... Peter has this gift of discernment or a word of knowledge, whichever gift is operational there, maybe both, and he sees right through Ananias. And so he says to him, look there in chapter 5, verse 3, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And by the way, for you note takers, this is a proof text to help us understand that in fact the Holy Spirit is God. Because in verse 3, Peter says you have lied to the Holy Spirit. In verse 4, Peter says you have not lied to men, but to God. So the Holy Spirit is God. God is the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, one God. So that's just a, a side proof text. But listen, this is an important other lesson. Number two, the early church was not mandated by the law to give. They were motivated by the heart. Notice verse 4. Peter says, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? What is he saying there? What he means is their possessions were their own in terms of management. Everything belongs to God. But in terms of management, their possessions were their own, and they could prayerfully determine how much to give and how much to keep. Now, that still is the case today. Everything that you and I have is from the hand of the Lord. And we're supposed to be good managers or stewards of it. And what God wants is for us to exercise our sanctified consciences in terms of how generous are we to be. Their sin here was not that, oh, you weren't generous enough and you held some of it back. It was their prerogative to prayerfully decide how much to give and how much to hold back. Their lie, their deception was giving the impression that they brought this wonderful offering when in fact they only had given a portion of it. That was their sin. It was deception. They were lying to God. They were lying to men. And again, Ananias and Sapphira don't come in at the same time. Ananias first comes in, gives this false impression. Peter uses discernment, says, no, this, you're giving this false impression. This is not everything you got, and you're lying not just to men, you're lying to God. And so verse 5, it says, then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last and so great fear came upon all those who heard these things, and the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. It's, it's part of the uh, Jewish law to bury one who dies before sundown. And verse 7 says, now it was about three hours later when his wife comes in, not knowing what had happened. Okay, so I'll summarize this conversation. So here she comes in three hours later. She doesn't know her husband's dead. And she walks in. 
And uh, Peter says, uh, Sapphira, where you been? Oh, you know, just three hours of shopping, you know, that's where I've been. <laughs> you know the old saying, Peter? Sapphira goes to Sephora. You know what I'm saying to you? Yeah. If you're not married, you have no idea what Sephora is. But anyway. He's like, well, your husband was here a little bit earlier. Was he? I've been trying to call him and text him. He has not been answering. I've been trying to get a hold of him. Peter says, yeah, well, he's been dying to see you. Literally. Yeah. Go with me. Come on. This is punny. She says, I know, he always does, you know, tend to be a mystery. He hides, sometimes he, you know, lays low. Oh yeah, he's laying low all right. <laughs> so, Sapphira, tell me, um, your husband brought in an offering because you guys sold some land. Yes, we did. And was that everything? Did you guys present the entire sum or was it just a portion? Oh no, it was everything. No, it was everything. It was wonderful. Praise Jesus, hallelujah. Oh yeah, you're gonna be praising him right now in person. Bang, and she's dead. <laughs> God kills her right there. Verse 9, then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband were at the door and they will carry you out. The guys are just standing there. These guys are just like, we got the casket ready. As soon as she goes, we're taking her out. <laughs> and he says to her, verse 10, then immediate, it says, then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So then the question is here, why would God do such a drastic thing by striking these two dead? And the answer is, listen to me on this, God, God took drastic measures to communicate a drastic message. And here's the message that he was trying to teach the early church and to teach us. The early church had to learn that the church pure is the church powerful. G. Campbell Morgan said that. But that's really the lesson here. The church pure is the church powerful. God expects his children, he expects the church to walk in holiness because he is a holy God. And it does not mean that we will be sinless this side of heaven, but it means the more we walk in holiness, the more we are determining to sin less until we get to heaven. Ananias and Sapphira were, were made examples by God for the early church and for us so that we can learn how much God hates it when his children walk in deliberate disobedience. Now again, you and I can be thankful that not every practice becomes a pattern in the Bible. What God did here was unique and he didn't repeat it. You know, if, if he were to strike dead, every one of us who had a bad thought or some sinful thing or some deception, the church would be empty today. Like, we wouldn't be here. So, so this didn't become a pattern where, where God just starts popping off every person who disobeys him. But he's sending this strong message. So this is the formation of the early church. The church has just barely been born here. They're just a couple of years old now at this point. And God is sending this strong message. Here's how I want my bride to live, to be pure, to walk in holiness before me, to be mindful of sin, to be quick to repent when we do sin. In 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Paul wrote, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Which leads me to the last point. Notice here, not once, but twice, it talks about how the fear of the Lord spread among the early church. Number four, the lesson, the final lesson to learn is the early church walked in the fear of the Lord. In verse 5, after Ananias died, it says, so great fear came upon all those who heard these things. In verse 11, after Sapphira died, it says, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. You see, God used the deaths of Ananias and Sapphira to give the early church and us a sobering awareness of his holiness. And when we walk in the fear of God, we tend to live more holy lives. See, holiness is both the sanctifying work of God's Spirit, and then it is the ongoing disposition of the saint. In other words, what do I mean is, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, 
and you put your faith and trust in Jesus, He cleanses our hearts. Okay, He sanctifies us. He washes us. He makes us holy. In other words, not perfect, not without sin until we get to be with Him, but He washes us and He cleanses us. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. This is what the Bible teaches. So there is this cleansing, sanctifying work that God does in our hearts when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. But then the Bible tells us to walk in holiness, to live out that sanctified life. And that requires a discipline and a determination that we will die to our flesh and we will live to the Spirit. Spirit. That there's this daily call in our lives as Christians to be mindful of the things that are sinful, that dishonor and displease God, and to walk in holiness that honors Him and pleases Him. And this is on us. And what will help us is if we have a healthy awareness, if we walk in the fear of the Lord. Now, this is a delicate balance. If, if, you, if your perspective of God is that He's this tender, loving Father, and that's all you think about, which he is, then you are likely to have um, less um, discipline in how you live out your life and you will engage in more sinful things, typically because you think, well, I got a loving dad and he's gonna forgive me because he always does. On the other hand, if, you're, if your view of God is only this tough judge, that might help you to walk in holiness, but you'll never develop a close and intimate relationship with him because instead of seeing him as God, your father, you're going to see him as the Godfather, and you don't really want to be near him. So it takes this delicate balance. We have to have a healthy fear of God, which means he's both a tender father, but he's a tough judge. And so I, I draw near to him because he's, he's a wonderful, loving, gracious, merciful father. But, but as a tough judge, he also expects us to live lives of holiness and purity before him, to honor him in how we conduct ourselves and how we behave. And so it's this delicate balance. It's not just thinking him only as a loving father or only as a tough judge, but it is this balance of his nature understanding the fullness of who God is, to motivate us to walk in the fear of the Lord. Listen, if I could just be as plain and basic as possible, if you and I are honest, do you know when you engage in deliberate sin? It's when you do not really have the fear of the Lord. Because if you and I had the fear of the Lord in the moment, we would not do half the things that we do. Do you remember when you as a kid were growing up and Every once in a while, your mom would, would play the wait till daddy gets home card. <laughs> Remember that? You know, you, you do something, she's like, wait till your father gets home. Just wait till your father gets home. Now, listen, I want to encourage moms. Look, you have the authority to discipline your kids right there. You don't have to wait till dad gets home. But it is sometimes a very meaningful and, uh, and, and motivating tactic to say, wait till your father gets home. And I, and I can remember, you know, when that would, put the, that would peer, put the fear of God in me, and that would put the fear of my dad in me, even though my dad is a very loving dad. But the idea that I've done something wrong, I've displeased him, we have to have a certain fear in a healthy way. And one of the things that helps a child to develop a, a conscience about right and wrong is when there is this realization that there is a higher authority here. And if I just willfully do things that I shouldn't, there are going to be consequences. So this is what God asks of us. And we can either come to Him, and we can either on our own recognize He is both a loving and a tough Father, and we have to walk in the fear of the Lord, and we can do that on our own by inviting him into every aspect. Lord, you see every aspect of my life, public and private. So God, I pray that you would help me to always be aware so that I can walk in the fear of the Lord, or, or we can learn that through painful consequences. We will develop a fear of God either on our own or through painful consequences. And if we develop it on our own, it's far better for us because it is less painful than if we have to learn to walk in the fear of God through, through painful consequences. I shared this story many years ago, but for those of you who are new in the past few years to Cornerstone, um, 
When I was a kid, I was like eight, nine, or 10. Uh, I don't even remember my age at the time, but um, my grandmother was born in a home in Myersville, Maryland, and she was one of 15 siblings. The house is still in our, in our family. It's my, my second cousin still owns the homestead in Myersville. And, and so as a kid, we would go there during the summers. Every Thursday was, was kind of like a, a reunion time because my grandmother's brother, my great uncle, owned the place after their parents died. And so anybody of the family could come on Thursday and, and hang out there. And so as a kid, I would go with my grandmother every Thursday to the farm. And my great uncle, who owned the property at the time, um, had a herd of cattle uh, back in the yonder, you know, 30 acres or so. And, um, and I would love to go up there and look at the cattle. But my grandmother and my great uncle said to me, do not get near the fence. It's an electric fence. <laughs> now, somebody can tell you something like, you know, you, you need to have a healthy respect for the fence. And you can decide on your own, I'm going to have a healthy respect for the fence. Or... Or you can learn through painful consequences. <laughs> and so I, you know, looking at it, it didn't look very painful. It just looked like, you know, these are just wires. You know, uh, this doesn't look like a big deal. And so I, I didn't really have the kind of respect for it that I should have. And I'm eight, nine, or ten, somewhere in there. And I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and every boy... Even if you live in town, most boys like, don't really care. They'll just go in the backyard. Well, this is a farm. Nobody's around. So I, I had to urinate. So I, I hit the fence, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and I learned a scientific experiment <laughs> that water conducts electricity. <laughs> I was knocked flat on my back. Everything's fine. I got married. I have three kids now. But, <laughs> but I'm telling you, I had to learn respect for that fence through painful consequences. There's one of two ways. I can either listen, uh, don't get near the fence, or I can test it myself, but I'm going to have to put up with the painful consequences. This is how it is. It's like, it's like we can learn, like we got to walk in the fear of God. Okay, somebody's told me that, but it's sometimes only through painful consequences that we really develop a fear of God. I hope that that's not our story. I hope our story is, you know what? God is holy and just and pure and righteous and perfect in all his ways. God, help me to walk in the fear of you at all times, at all places, in public, in private, with everything that I do say and think. May it honor you. Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 13 says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Listen to that. The first on that list I just read there from Deuteronomy 10 was to fear the Lord your God, and it ends with for your good. It's for our good that we fear the Lord. David had a simple prayer in Psalm 86, 11, when he said, teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. May God help us to learn lessons from the early church. Amen. Let's share communion together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the lessons of the early church, and particularly this last thing here about walking in holiness, the church pure is the church powerful. We pray, God, that we would have an awesome reverence for who you are, that it wouldn't take some painful consequence to teach us, but that we would want to honor you in our private life and our public life and what we say, think, or do. Help us, Lord, to develop a healthy fear of the Lord always knowing your tender side, you are loving, you are merciful, you are forgiving, but also having a deep reverence for the tough judge of the universe who is holy and says to us, I am holy, therefore be holy as I am holy. Lord, help us to walk in a way that pleases you and honors you. And when we do sin and fall short, thank you that we can run to you as our loving father to forgive us. 
But Lord, even speak to us now about things that we need to purge from our lives, things we need to confess as sin, things, Lord, that are displeasing to you. Even now, as we draw near to the table of the Lord, may we come with clean hands and a pure heart, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us, that we might experience his grace and his forgiveness to approach the table with clean hands and a pure heart because of Christ and what he's done for us. Bless this time, Lord, as we remember your sacrifice, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, who died on a cross to purify us, to cleanse us, to save us. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name, amen.